In part one of Nehemiah, I went through and began to cover the specifics about Nehemiah, specifically about prayer. It's recorded 11 times through the book of Nehemiah that he is actually found engaged in prayer through the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the wall and what he's particularly dealing with. We also went through his state of mind and his condition of what drove him to be able to look into the problems that were facing Jerusalem at that time, its state of captivity, the condition of the people. And if you go to Nehemiah verse, chapter 1, verse 6, you get, a, you get an idea of what he was trying to convey. Now, there's many, many stories in Nehemiah that you can draw from. And what I'm trying to do in, in, in this series is to focus in on several different aspects as we can understand how Nehemiah can apply to us today or to an end-time work or to the condition that God's people are going to find themselves in before the return of Christ. And in Nehemiah 1.6, we went through and we read, it says, please, he's, he's pleading to God. He says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night. So we looked at the condition of Nehemiah, who was a man of prayer. Uh, he, was, he was steadfast, that he didn't give up on what he felt drawn to do. And you know, from time to time, people that I'll talk to, they feel that type of compassion themselves for something that God has for them to do. And you really need to follow through on that passion. You weigh it out before God. You, you pray about it. You think about it. And for those that may be around you or even in your same home, they may never feel or understand what God has put in your heart to deal with. But you do. And when you feel that passion, and what's what I'm going to cover today, this Nehemiah, the, the part three, is a man of passion. But if God has given you something to do that you know in your heart that is a good work, that it's a positive work, it may be simply making sure that the elderly around you or someone that you've been, been brought to your care is, is taken care of day and night, making sure they have food or a place to stay. But you do it and you, you care for that need that God's given to you with every ounce of fiber that's in you. Now, this is the condition that, that Nehemiah was in. He says, and I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. And he realized that the right and the wrong and the sins that came about and the condition he found the people in Jerusalem and where he was is a result of sin. Because when you begin to see and you read through the first book of Jeremiah, you see that he's relating to God the words of God's own first five books. And he's telling God, this is what you said, God. So you knew that he was a man who was familiar with God's word. And he says, and go on when he's confessing the sins, he says, both my father's house and I have sinned. That condition of humility, of passion, of love, his steadfastness, you find that in most of the men of, of God of the Old and New Testaments. You look at the Apostle Paul. I don't know how many people had the stamina to do what the Apostle Paul did. To be able to be beaten, <laughs> left for dead, stoned under rocks, and to get up, shake himself off, be healed, and go to the next city and have him done all over again. Beaten with stripes. And, he, and as he said, that it might be that he might save some. The condition of Paul's mind was that, that he was resilient. And, and if God, if we knew what God had in store for us, now, now put this on a personal basis. And supposing that you knew in 10 years what God has in store for you. Of course, you condition, you condition whether you actually do what God wants you to or not because you can walk away from God. But let's suppose God has been working with you individually for a specific task. And he knows to accomplish that task, you're going to have to develop the ability for the patience, for the stamina, for the endurance, the ability to be persecuted, so that when that task comes, 
like with Abraham. When his task came, he had to take to sacrifice his own son. Now, we know in his early years he probably couldn't have done that because there he was with fear, and he gave up his wife to save his own life. So, But when time came for that, that test, he had been through a lot, and he was able to make that decision to do and trust God. So now when we back to ourselves, let's suppose down the road, God says, let me show you what great things you're going to have to suffer for my name's sake. And in the vision, as Paul was blinded, for three days, he had to think about his condition and what it was that God was going to have for him to do. And from the beginning, God tells Paul, let me show you what great things you'll have to suffer for my name's sake. So when Paul counted that cost, he knew well in advance what he was going to have to do. And merciful God to us, sometimes he doesn't tell us all those things. But sometimes what you go through today, the pain, the suffering, the difficulties, it's for a purpose down the road that you're being strengthened. You're being conditioned in your mind and your heart so that you can deal with whatever it is that God has for you at a later time so that you can become an overcomer, so that you'd be ready to take that test. You know, you can look, you can draw the analogies to the physical. You know, a person who runs, if they're not in condition, they're never going to make a marathon. A person who is not in shape, and I realized how much out of shape I was when I came back to the city and began to have to move a lot of trees. Anybody go through that? I mean, I woke up every morning and I was sore. And you worked till your bones was tired and you'd sweat and it was so hot and dry that you just, till you run out of energy, and the next morning you get up and do it again until everything's finally moved out. And it takes days, weeks, and sometimes months to get that accomplished. So we have to go through a period of growing. Nehemiah was a captive in, in, in the king's court, and he was a cupbearer, so he had a high position. And his condition was not where he was at, but where he believed God wanted him to be. Now, that's an important message at the beginning to understand that where we're at today in our life is a temporary dwelling to where God wants us to be in his kingdom. And what he brings us through today, the state of mind and the condition that we go through, will determine whether God will use us down the road. And so when I read where it says, both my father's house and I have sinned, is we need to go before God and understand what we really are and put it in God's hands. He goes on to say in verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments nor the statutes or the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Now I think about that and, and I understand his condition and it reminded me of another scripture. I'll read it to you. You really don't have to turn there, but if you want to write it down and go back and look, it's a, a scripture that's familiar to all of us, I'm sure. In, in, uh, it's found in Psalms where David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know, as this translation says, my anxieties, his emotions, and see if there be any wicked in me, and lead me in the way to everlasting. So in part, that's what Nehemiah was doing. He was, he was evaluating himself as he went before God in prayer. When he did that, he had three things. No, four things that he, he put into play at the very beginning. After he heard the condition of what the people were going through. And I know that those here in the hurricane area, the people went through the same thing. What condition are they in? How are they? Have you heard from so-and-so? You know, how, how, is, how did they make out? I know they're in a, flooded, a flood zone area. And so everybody began to wonder in a condition, and you would tell them, and you'd watch the tears as they pour from people's eyes. And, and, and it was so wonderful to see what can we do to help. And you're saying I began to hear the phone calls from people around the country that I never heard of before. You know, I talked to people in Chicago and out west and New York, people I just never seen or heard, I didn't know who they were, who said, we have a home, we want to help. And when one person said, we're going to round up a bunch of people and we'll come down and help whatever we can do, we'll help build. I, I thought it was amazing to see how the people was caring. Well, that's what Nehemiah was doing. So he, he had three things or four things he wanted to do. The first thing he did is he went to God in prayer. The very first thing he did, and everything he did, you go through this entire book of Nehemiah, you see the first thing he does when the problem arises, he goes to God in prayer. Second, 
He relied on God's word for direction. He didn't lean to his own understanding. He didn't justify his condition. Say, well, it's okay if I did this right now because. He, led, he, he, was, he looked to God for direction. And the third thing, which is so hard for us to do quite often, is wait for an answer. You know, wait for an answer to see what's going what's to happen or what, what direction God brings you in. And then the fourth thing that he did. If you've been moved, and as, as I said earlier, it, there's something you feel God's in, it, it's pushing in your heart to do, he developed a plan on how he was able to accomplish while he was in captivity, knowing there was not a thing he could do, he actually developed a plan in his mind as to what he wanted to do. In part two, we covered that Nehemiah was a man of vision. That he, that he, he would look at the, his own condition and see beyond that. And that's what God's people are going to have to do at the end time. When you look around the world and you look at the conditions that things are, are turning into, we realize how small, I mean, if you put all the church back together, I mean, how much difference can they really make going forward unless God actually intervenes and opens doors? And yet, we know that he will. God will open those doors at the end time. He set himself to pray. He set himself to mourn and to fast. And he was patient. He waited four to five months for an answer. And in Nehemiah 2, verse 12, it says, Then I arose in the night. He set himself to his course and his plan to get things done. He says, I and a few men with me, and I told, told no one what my God had put into my heart to do at Jerusalem. He knew what his purpose was, and he set about to do it. He didn't wait for approval. He didn't wait for, uh, he didn't worry about the conflict or people objecting to what he was doing. He simply went about getting the job done once he found the door was opened to go through it. And that's what God's church needs to do. When the door's open, we need to move and go forward. So Nehemiah puts his plan in action. In chapter 2, we covered. In, ch in chapter 2, verse 16, it says, And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. What he actually began to do is he went into the city of Jerusalem, and he went about by night. And he began to survey what he had to do to overcome the problems that were there. He, so he can develop in his mind what his first step was going to be. So he had this plan developed. He had never seen the condition. All he knew was what he heard from those who came to tell him about his brethren. He says, I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. He went about setting his plan and put it into place. Now, there's the, another message you need to learn about this, that whenever you're going to do God's work, it's quite, it's, it's really funny in most cases that you think everybody would say, this is a good idea, let's do it. The first thing happens, you will find a lot of people around you, even those closest to you quite often will say, oh, you can't do that. That'll never work. We've tried that before. We've been through that. No, don't worry about it. Well, the very first thing he finds when he begins to set about doing the job that God gave him was Tobias in Sandballot saying, you can't do that, and began to mock him, and he didn't let it stop, stop him. He went on to say in verse 20, he says, and so I answered them and says, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. That's pretty bold. He knew that God was with him. And when you begin set about your task, you need to understand that it's of God. It will get accomplished if you don't turn back. So as he began his program to develop Jerusalem, the first thing he does is he gives the people some vision and some hope. In Nehemiah 2, verse 17, it says, Then I said unto them, this is after those who were scoffing, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste. And his gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been upon, good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. And so they said, let us rise and build. And they set their hands to do this good work. 
You know, we were very, very fortunate. I feel very blessed to be a part of the work here in New Orleans with what you all did when we was able to buy this building. Anybody in their right mind would look at it and say, this, is not, this can't be done. You know, and I'm reminded of the time when we had some people who came and visited from another church that has 2,000 members. And they said they couldn't get the volunteers to do with 2,000 people what you did here in New Orleans. And I'm not saying that to, to boast about you or to praise you, but to know that there was a vision and a hope that God put in each one of you all. And the work went forward day and night when we had the opportunities to work. And I remember being in this building for almost, I don't know, a month, two months we were working, and we finally got electricity restored. And I brought Audrey over here one night. I said, let me show you something. We walked in, and I walked to that front door, and I hit that switch, and I turned the light on. I said, what do you think? And she's looking around, and she says, I don't see anything. I said, no, we got a switch. we got a switch. <laughs> That's how bad the building was. And there we were in decay and in rubble. And the work was going forward. We didn't have no power. We had nothing here to work with. And I was so excited because I could hit a switch and turn on a light. I had to show somebody. We made progress. We got a light now. Now, I don't mean that sound like a whole lot, but it was important. To me, I could see that we were moving forward, and God had given us opportunity, just like he gave us, gave us the ability to, to do those demolitions and to bring in the material. Somehow, brethren, I don't know how yet, and I pray before God that we can find a way to help God's people scattered abroad across this country who are just looking for some hope and some direction. That we can give them and inspire the people with hope that we can work as a unit, as a body, to do a task, to do a job, and to care one for another, and prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I know the job's going to get done, and there's going to be two witnesses out there who are going to probably fulfill most of what we understand is going to ignite that return. And yet, we will have a part of that work also. So now he goes on to say, as we, as we covered in the, in the first, the first uh, two, two parts, and he says that they had set their hands to do a good work. One of the most important messages that we have from the book of Nehemiah, from my opinion here, is this. I believe that one of the most important messages of the book of Nehemiah is that God is looking into the hearts of his people to do a work like unto that of Nehemiah. And through this book, he is showing us how it can be accomplished. So what we need to do now is to take apart what it is that God has here so that we can use and apply it in our day and time. Nehemiah, part three. When I, when I closed the last session in Nehemiah part two, we close in chapter two, verse 20. I introduced chapter three and left off there. And this is where I want to pick up today. Nehemiah three, verse one. And then Elishab, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. And that's where I left off. And I said, to go home and try to look up why he began there. So now, if we pick up the story, it says, and they consecrated it, and they hung its doors. The very first thing that Nehemiah does is he begins to build the gate that is closest to the temple. The closest to the temple. Now, what he had done before he began the building is he rounded up the leadership the high priest and the priest brethren to begin to do the work. Let's back up to chapter 2, verse 20. He says, And then I answered them, and I said unto them, The God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore we and his servants will arise and build. But you, talking about Tobias and Sanballat, you will have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. He's telling those who oppose the rebuilding, the preparation for Jerusalem, because remember, this is an end time, it's one of the end time books of the Old Testament, Nehemiah and Ezra, with, with the perhaps Malachi maybe being a little 
a little older or a little bit newer in, in the, uh, the close of the Old Testament, that this book is a close as it prepares to rebuild Jerusalem before Christ returns. And so by the time Christ returns, you actually see that there is a Jerusalem that is in full force at the time that, Je that Jesus comes. Now, he goes on to say now in 3, verse 1, Then Elishab, the high priest, rose up with his brethren. So the priest and those that were with him, his family and friends, and they built the sheep gate, the one that was closest to the temple. It was also the entrance to, the, to one of the gateways into uh, the northern ten tribes. I believe, if, if, if you look at the map, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's where it was, was located. And they sanctified it. Now, that's a very important point, that when you sanctify something, you have set it apart, just like God did the Sabbath day. He rested and he sanctified, or he set it apart for a holy purpose, is that they sanctified the gate. That means they did some type of sacrificial worship at that point. Now, that's, that means that's very important. So what this did for the people is it gave them a sense of the past coming back to life. It gave them a sense of hope. As I drive through the city and I would come back and I'd been working over by George and Betty's helping restore some of the damage that they had at their home, I would come back into the city at night. And as I would come across the bridges and especially the high rise, I would look around and each day I would notice there were more lights. Now, I, don't, I don't know if you paid attention to that. And every day I would see that there was this little glimmer of hope. Not that anybody was all back there yet, but at least from the high rise, over the city and out toward the Seabrook Bridge and out toward Leon C. Simon and up and down Franklin Avenue, I could see little pockets of electricity coming back on. The east was far, was far worst. And so when you see that, or you hear that there was a new section of the city that was opening up, it was to give people hope. And so what Nehemiah did is he rounded up the leadership and he went to the high priest and he, he tells the high priest, God has done this and put this in my heart and this is what we intend to do. And we're going to start by the house of God. And so they did. They built that gate. And the people were inspired and they set it aside and they sanctified it. That means there was a type of worship. And I'm sure in the people's minds who were still captives said maybe there's hope for us. And their minds would go back to the time of David and the time of Solomon. And when Israel was one nation with all its power and glory and God was leading them at that time. And it gave them some inspiration to go on. And then you can go through the rest of this chapter and you can read. And, and God has preserved in this chapter the entire wall and who was working on that wall. And one day when we were in the kingdom, wouldn't it be nice to sit down and go through our, our, our Old Testament and you go find this guy and say, you know, I read about you. You were in charge of this. Tell me, what was it like? Wouldn't that be incredible? Because we're going to have that opportunity to actually sit down and understand what they had to go through. And as you go through the book of Nehemiah and you see the opposition and the threats and the lies and the people that they had to work with with swords in their hands because they were afraid they would be killed. How did you do it? What went through your mind? And you begin to try to get imagine of, of what was taking place back then. So the people began to muster support. And you can see the excitement building. And then, and then they, they sanctified the gate. Now look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Because not everybody was happy about this. Now this gives us the indication that they actually did do sacrifice because of this. Nehemiah 4, verse 1. But it so happened that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and indignant. And he mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Like, like, who are these people? You know, what do they think they're up to? And that's what they're going to say about God's people at the end time. When the message goes before this world and it says, Unless you repent, you're going to be destroyed. And they're going to look at God's people and say, Who do you think you are? You're just a handful of people out there. You have nothing. You're weak. You're feeble. Look at our temples. Look at our, our churches. I have 15,000 people. We have millions of dollars. We broadcast all over the world. We have our own satellites. Who are you feeble people thinking you can tell us what to do? 
And God's looking for the hearts of individuals at that time who can raise up and say, this is what God has put in my heart. And I'm here to tell you, unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. I don't care what you've got. And I listen to businessmen on the radio after the hurricane. Men who are multimillionaires, own many businesses and homes and boats. On the radio and said they lost everything in one fell swoop. It's all gone. Not knowing how they're going to rebuild. I watched a news clip just the other night. Here's a man that said he had a $180,000 home. They're showing a picture of it, completely gutted. All he got is just mold everywhere. He's living in a tent in his backyard, and he's hoping to get a trailer. What a contrast. And God says it's going to happen that way all around the world. You hear this man saying, who are these feeble Jews? What do they think they're doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Because, see, he was referring to them when they built that sheep gate and when they sanctified that wall. When you sanctify something, you set apart and you sacrifice to God to honor that sanctification. He says, will they sacrifice? Will they complete it in a day? He says, How, you, you think they're actually going to get this thing done is what he's saying? Or will they receive stones from the heaps of rubbish and stones that are burned? They literally not only had to gather the wood and the lumber from the king's forest, but they had to go through the piles of rubble and clean up the stones and restack them because the piles of rubbish were so high, as you'll read in another, another section, is that they, that they couldn't even tell that the enemy could come because the rubbish was so high. And he had to set watchmen all around the gates because there were so much piles of rubbish they couldn't see. And they could sneak through the city to attack him as they rebuilt it. Now understand the, 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 the society, even though they were in captivity, everything they did revolved around the temple and the sacrifice. That was their central order of organizational worship. It was the priesthood who governed how they operated. And even though they were in captivity, that respect was still given at that time. Because you remember at the beginning, Nehemiah, verse 3, rose up with the high priest. So there was still, even though they were in captivity, a system of order that God had left in Jerusalem at that time. So now that's the condition they were in, the time frame. Remember, the time frame that this book is, goes along with Nehemiah, which is a type of, of the end of the close of the Old Testament, which is the time of a preparation for Jesus Christ's coming. Now draw the parallel, an end time message. An end time message is the type of Jerusalem, the temple of God is in ruin. And I consider that to like the people, the church. It's a condition that God has to restore within individuals to prepare them for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, you've got, you got, you got to magnify the understanding of physical to the spiritual end time of what we're going through today. Now, as we go through that, let me give you some, some understanding and some thoughts about this. In Malachi verse four, chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, Malachi 4 verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So now we're going to look for it as a message. And you understand that the message of Elijah and the powerful work that he did at that time. Now there is a type. There is a type before the return, before the actual coming of Jesus Christ. The first time we have a type that gives us the indication of what the work in Elijah is going to be like before Jesus Christ comes back. It's found in Matthew 11 in verse 12. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets of the law are prophesied until John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Referring to John the Baptist. So Malachi shows us clearly before the dreadful day of the Lord. Now that only refers to one time. That's the return of Jesus Christ, the dreadful day of the Lord. There's no mistake in that. All Bible theologians will clearly uh, they, they clearly come together on that understanding. We talk about the dreadful day of the Lord. That's not the first coming of Christ. That's the second. So we're talking about an Elijah that's going to come before the return of Christ at the end time. 
What Jesus Christ is telling us is that there is an Elijah who is to come, yet there is one already come. And so we get a glimpse of what the work's going to be like from, from the John the Baptist. And it says, He it is, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So now we get an indication now that the, that the Elijah that's going to come is going to be likened unto that of John the Baptist. Matthew 17.10 goes on to say, Matthew 17.10, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say unto you, Elijah has already so you see, it's like, it's like double talk. But what he's trying to show us is that Elijah is indeed going to come. And Jesus Christ says, that's going to be the time of that dreadful day before the Lord. The work of Elijah, what was the work of Elijah? Well, we can look in the Old Testament, we can see what that work was. And there's going to be two witnesses who are on the scene who are definitely going to come with that power of an Elijah. And they're going to, they're going to come just like Elijah did. They're going to walk before this world. And probably on all the national, you probably see them on CNN and all the rest of them. Because the whole world is going to see these guys. And they're going to stand before the entire world and say, By my word, you'll not have rain for three and a half years. And all the world will dry up. And there won't be any rain. And everybody's going to laugh and to, to scorn and to mock. And he said, Who are these feeble to? And then you and I are going to witness that. When we see that, people will be laughing around us and we'll grab our Bibles and say, these men are correct. Let me show you why. And it's going to bring about hatred and persecution like you can't imagine. And during that time, God's people are going to throw through terrible sufferings. And just like the conditions that the people are in today all around this, the, the hurricane-ravaged areas, they're suffering and they need help. God's going to raise up a people like unto that of John the Baptist, the type of Elijah that was going to come and you can read him what he did in Luke chapter 1, verse 16. And it says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Now, when all that happens through that tribulation period, when these men began to preach, and that warning message goes out, the Bible tells us there's going to be a great innumerable multitude of people who come out of that tribulation who have washed their robes and who will be, who'll be purified and who will be white before God Almighty. So that means that the work of God will be accomplished. Somebody's going to do that job. And I believe the, one of the messages of, Ge of Nehemiah, as I read just a minute ago, was to look into the hearts of his people, those today who are preparing to help those to, to warn this message and to be ready when that time comes. Amos 6, 6 says that woe unto those who find themselves with who are just at ease. There's a warning message that God gives to those who are at ease. He goes on to say here, He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. We're talking about a, a bringing back of, of people of love and, com and compassion. And you know how a father loves their children as they raise them. And it's so, so near and dear and the family that they care so much about. It's going to take people to restore that kind of love again. We look out there now and you find there's just, just tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of children with, with single homes. Many people who don't know who their, their parents are. And it was amazing how many children were separated during this hurricane. Three or four weeks after the hurricane, there was still like 3,000 kids. They didn't know where any parent was and how they got separated in such a small area of just across the south that 3,000 kids were missing. And by the way, I don't know if you saw the report, just came out just a couple days ago. They estimated at least 26 people now, they determined died from non-hurricane related deaths. Probably killed. And of course some people say that's just an exaggeration. Well they're not finished all the examination yet, but they're up to 26 people now that they say died from non-hurricane related so they ask them, were they murdered? And they say, well, they won't go that far yet. They won't tell us exactly how they died. They just didn't die from the hurricane. So that means the hurricane victims are dropping. Now, did you notice that? The hurricane victims are actually dropping as murder-related or non-hurricane-related continues to rise as the balancing act continues to go forth. 
And then it goes on to say, the work of Elijah, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, how do you do that? How do you make the people prepared to meet their God? It's got to go into the scriptures. It's got to go into the understanding of God's holy word to bring them to repentance, to bring them to the understanding. And the word repentance, the word keep the law, is like a nasty word, even to many in religious and the societies, because the law has been done away with. But yet that's a job that we have to do, because Jesus Christ says before he returns, there's going to be an Elijah. And that Elijah is to go before and to prepare a people to make them ready to meet their creator, to be with their elder brother for the marriage of the Lamb. What an incredible task that you and I have is to help people know their father and their elder brother, Jesus Christ. One of the warmest things I've seen over the years is when people visit with us at the, at the, here in, in some of the churches we get to go visit and at the feast is they find the, the friendliness the warmth of love and compassion. And it makes them feel like a family. And, and that can only come from God's spirit of, of love and compassion one for another. Now, while this was going on in Nehemiah, and he was beginning to build, and he began to, res to get the opposition from those going on around him, there was another thing that was taking place at the exact same time. Remember the companion book to Nehemiah, which is Ezra. Now, if you turn to Ezra, I'm going to pull in another aspect of the story. And I'm, I'm, I'm building these sermons like a Bible study type in nature. So you've got to go pull in a bunch of different things together and try to get a clear picture of what it is that God's been preparing or trying to give us to understand. And I know if you go through and you read Nehemiah and you put it aside after going through this series and you pick it up next year or next month, you can pick it up and you can pick up a whole new sense of understanding. So I'm trying to give through just a sense of balance of relationship to duality and end time in relationship to, to us. So in Ezra chapter 8, okay, Ezra chapter 8 and verse 1, we pick up the story It says, Now these are the heads of their father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those that went up from, with me from Babylon and the reign of King Xerxes. Now, I don't want to go through the whole chapter, and you can read the genealogies. But let's pick up now in verse 15 to understand what it was that Ezra was doing who was working in companionship with Nehemiah. Now remember, Ezra was the priest. Nehemiah was more like the, he was actually the governor when he was there. So he was actually doing the physical work of the building. So while this, the so Jerusalem is being built, the priest is building his priesthood to reestablish the work of the temple. So he goes on to verse 15, he says, Now I gathered them by the river, because they, they, they gathered all the people together that came up with them from Babylon. So I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava, and we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and the priests, and I found none that were the sons of Levi. See, Ezra's job was to establish the priesthood again. So while Jerusalem was being built, see, God had a bigger plan. God had a type of building that was going to go on in the preparation for the return, for the actual coming of Jesus Christ. And we saw that in Daniel last week when we, when we kept part two. So I'll pick up a little more of that in just a minute. Verse 15. Now you can see in verse 16 what he was doing there. He was finding people, who, men of, who had wisdom, men who had understanding, who can help him to do what needed to be done from Ezra's point. Verse, chapter, verse 17, I'll, come, I'll pick it up there. And I gave them a command for Ido, the chief man at the palace of Capsia. Then I told them what they should say unto Ido and his brethren, and Nehithim at the place of Capsia, that they should bring us servants for the house of God. Then, by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of, of Miley, the son of Levi, the son of Israel named Serebiah, and his sons and brothers, 18 men. So now they began to find men of wisdom. They were men of, of, uh, of Levi, of the house in Israel. And he goes on to say, And Hashbiah with him, and Jerob, Je Jeshiah, boy, these names. I'll, one of these days I'm going to get these names down. Jeshiah, the sons of Mer Mariah, and his brothers and their sons were 20 men. 
And so you see what he began to gather of all the leadership, verse 20, 220. And all of them were designated by name. So God was able to bring in the, re in the restoration a priesthood. Remember, he, uh, he was gathering from around the world, or around their world at the time, a priesthood. Now remember what we read last week in, in Revelation. It says that he's going to establish the kingdom of priests or kings and priests. And that's what he says in, in Revelation. Now, if you go through and try to put this into a comparison, you Matthew 24, 31, it says, and he will send his angels, Matthew 24, 31, you understand, is an end-time prophecy. He will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds. So at the end time, just like here with the rebuilding, is that when Jesus Christ comes, this entire world is in decay probably one-tenth of mankind still alive. Rubble all over. Sickness, disease, bodies. You can read about the devastation throughout the, the Old and some of the New Testament of how bad it's going to be. And just like when he went back, Nehemiah, as he surveyed what it had to be done, he began to rebuild. And the high priest at the end time is going to be Jesus Christ, our high priest, is going to come back as this rebuilding process goes on He's going to establish a priesthood again to work with him. And God says it will be a kingdom of priests. That will be his religious order. And how it works, That I don't have a clear picture for everybody to, to explain it myself. And it's interesting when you sit down amongst the brethren, most people have an idea how it's going to work. And actually you get into people who will argue about how it will work during the, during the millennial reign. And I like to take a different approach and just sit back and just let them argue. Because <laughs> I don't have a clear picture altogether. I've got an understanding of what's going to happen. I know it's going to take place, and I can stand firm on that, but exactly what God's going to do and how he's going to do it, I don't really know yet. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us we can only see vaguely through a dim-lit mirror, so to speak, or through a foggy glass of what it's going to be like. But yet we have a, a kind of an indication of what God's going to do. So now, he's going to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Mark 13, 27 kind of reinforces that. Let me read that. It says, And then he will send his angels. He will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now we're talking about the elect, those that are going to be called from this life, those who had died, those who have made it into the first resurrection. And he's gathering these people to do what Ezra is doing in the Old Testament, to reestablish the priesthood to work around the temple of God. Now that's what's going on here in the book of Ezra. Zechariah 14 verse 4 says, And in that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split into two, from the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north, and half shall move toward the south. Then you shall flee through the mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach into Ezel. And yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And thus the Lord may God will come in all his saints with you. We're talking about a time that when Jesus Christ actually comes, he's going to, he's going to establish his temple again. Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. He's going to gather all his elect. And those positions will be given of rulership and authority. And that's what we're trying to find here. We're going on through with, with, uh, with the book of Ezra. And you see that Ezra was actually going back to the law and see who worked the temple. And as he brought them all together in the leadership, he went for three days. He couldn't find any of them with the sons of Levi. There was no one there qualified. So they had to go find people that qualified. And Jesus Christ is qualifying those people today who are going to serve and rule with him in his kingdom. They're called the elect. The firstborn, those are going to be with Christ when he comes, when he stands with his feet on the Mount of Olives. It's God who chooses the people. We don't choose one another. If we did, we probably wouldn't have any, many, many people there with us. We're kind of opinionated. People get on our nerves and hurt our feelings. Before you know, brothers don't talk to brother, and they leave one another. Next thing you know, we've got four or 500 churches out there with different names because people just can't get along. 
Thankfully, God's going to do the choosing. and he's going to set those who he believes should be in those proper positions. God looks for those that are convicted, those that are willing to count the cost and to take and do that job, whatever it is God has given you to do. Despite the, the rebuke, the rebuttals, the anger, the lies, the persecution, because it all will come. And if you're alive before Jesus Christ returns, set your heart to know now. If you haven't had it yet, you will before Christ returns. Every man will have to count the cost, every man, woman, and child that God has given a calling. Now back to Nehemiah, the understanding of Nehemiah. And why all this was taking place, we went through some of this last week, but I want to go through it in a little bit more detail now. We'll pick up the story in Daniel 9, because you see he's rebuilding Jerusalem. And throughout the entire Old Testament, there's only one place that we can see that there was a decree ever given to go back and build Jerusalem that was given to Nehemiah. Daniel 9, verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then if you go on to read a couple verses down, and there'll be one more week. And this is the prophecy we see of Daniel in the 70 weeks. And it says, And the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. Now, during his time, there was troublesome times, because you see, they were trying to destroy the work of what was being built there. And when you look at the time frame, and you understand that what we're talking about is 69 weeks plus one week. Now, the week, you need to understand this on the weeks, and this is why I didn't cover enough last time. I want to go back in through that. These are called weeks of years. Now, where do we get this from, the weeks of years? If you look at the time frame of the king when he was sent back into Jerusalem to rebuild, and you understand from, from Genesis... Uh, let's go to Genesis now. Genesis chapter um, 29. Genesis chapter 29. I know we're jumping around, but this is, this is laying the foundation for, for the zeal that's going to come from Nehemiah because you need to understand the background of what God was doing as he was beginning to restore Jerusalem for a type of the end time, the work that was taking place, the hearts of the individuals that God's going to use to do the work, the opposition to the work, to give us a picture of what's building as we're looking at an end time work in type. All right, so now we're in, Gen we're in Genesis 29, and we, we can pick it up from the story of Jacob. All right, now you remember the story of Jacob. Jacob loved Rachel, and he was willing to work for Rachel seven years. All right, let's pick up the story in, in 29. In verse 18. So Jacob loved Rachel, and Rachel said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. So he goes on, he wants to, he's going to work for her for seven years so that he can marry her. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. He says, So stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days to him because of the love that he had had for her. You know, what a story of love a man working seven years for. Now, that nowadays, people want to meet, and they get married in a couple of weeks, and can't get along, and I didn't know you were like that. And next thing you know, they're fighting, the boys runs rampant. Now, you know the story. He gets tricked. Of course, there's something to be said there about drinking too much on your wedding night, too. All, all the guys would think, well, he, was, he got, he got, he got uh, tricked. Well, if you wouldn't have drank so much, you probably would have known he was with the wrong woman. All right, so let's go on with the story. Verse 21, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go to her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the palace, and he made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he, that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went to her, went into her. And Laban gave his, his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. And so it came to pass that in the morning that, behold, it was Leah, and he said to Laman, What is this that you have done to me? Was it not Rachel that I served you? And then, he, then you have deceived me. And Laban said, It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now here's, where, here's what he says. Fulfill her week. 
he said before he's going to work for her for seven years, remember? Now Laban says, fulfill her a week. A week is as if it was seven years. A day is a year. Now, when we looked at Daniel, we looked at the weeks. And the weeks, if you went through as days, it would be, I think it was 490 years, a total. So there's a period of time that was taking place in the book of Daniel that God says from the time the decree went out to rebuild Jerusalem. And if you look at and you put a time frame into the Old Testament from the time of Nehemiah, you will come to the time of Christ is 69 weeks and a week, the, the seventh week, or bringing you to the 70 weeks. And it says that Jesus Christ would be cut off in the midst of the week. So during that time, from the time of Christ to the, 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 the collapse of Jerusalem, we're talking about a period of about 70 weeks that was taking place. And in the book of Nehemiah, this is the only time you see of the rebuilding being ordered from God. And it was given to Nehemiah. And God had to search for an individual who had the passion to fulfill God's desire to begin to rebuild Jerusalem. And you look at the weeks that was, and it's broken down when you read it, it's broken down to, uh, uh, let's see how it's broken down. At the first it has seven weeks, which is a type of the restoration of Jerusalem in the Old Testament, which, which was approximately 49 years, plus 62 weeks, which brings you to the time of Christ coming in his ministry and the rest of the time when Jesus Christ actually served and he was cut off until the actual collapse of Jerusalem. We're talking about a period in the prophecy of about 70 years. And what we're looking at there is the restoration of Jerusalem. And what God is going to come back when Jesus Christ returns, we're going to see the second part of his ministry coming in. And during that time, there's going to be a rebuilding and the establishing of a Jerusalem again. And Revelation tells us about that restoration. And what God's doing today is he was with Nehemiah and those that they were beginning to begin to work Jerusalem and the walls and the gates is the men and the women who had the passion to serve God with all their heart, who was willing to, to go without. They said they wore their dirty clothes and the only time they ever changed them was when they had to wash them. They put them back on and they went to work. And we began to see that when they worked at night and the fear came upon them because they said they were going to come in and kill them all that they work with one hand with a weapon and the other hand build them with one with the other hand. And they would set watchmen all around the city to protect them. But they never gave up. Could it be, as I read before, we get to that little statement that I believe, and in my heart this is one of the most important messages of this book, is that, is that God is looking into the hearts of his people, looking into the hearts of you and I, if indeed we are an end time generation, which I do believe we are, that God has to build within your heart the ability to have the passion, the driving force, to move forward despite what goes on around you, to do the work that God has ahead of us that we have not yet understood, not to the depth that we need to, that you and I are willing to lose our lives, put them on the line to do that work and get that message out. And God is preparing a people and that's what John the Baptist did. He put his life on the line. He was the type of Elijah that was going to come. And Jesus Christ said, indeed, he did come. And he's looking at those individuals and said, I can use this person. And I can use that person. And this one has a weakness here. Or that one has a weakness. So I've got to get that weakness out of them. The only way to do it, I'm going to put them through a trial. And that trial is going to show their weaknesses. And through their weaknesses, as Paul said, he will overcome the weakness that they have so that when that trial comes, because my word will not fail, God says, and God is going to use people that it won't fail. And so I say, is it possible that God is looking into the hearts of his people to see that who he will use to build and restore Jerusalem when Jesus Christ returns and the trials that we face today are to make us stronger to go through, to build during that time? So God had a plan. That plan came through Nehemiah. He worked alongside with Ezra as it began to build the priesthood. He found the, the power within individuals who were willing to dedicate all, to do the work. People had the vision and the insight to look beyond what we see. You go out to this world today and tell everyone, look, everything you see here, what we just went through, Katrina, is nothing compared to what's coming. 
This entire nation is going to be wiped out. One-tenth of the people, there's going to be sickness and disease, and there won't be a government to help you. There won't be a FEMA or a Red Cross. And people are going to wander from street to street, and they're going to want to know where is the word of God, and where is God at? And God will be speaking, and he'll be speaking through you and through me. And through all of those that God has called who are preparing a people to, prepared, to be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. And he's building in us today the character to love one another despite ourselves so that we can overcome the weaknesses that are in us to do the work that lies ahead. He calls for sacrifice on our parts. It calls for dedication. It calls for conviction. And what God has laid out before us in his book of Nehemiah is the character of an individual that we need to be like. And I'm going to pick up that story in the next message as we talk about Nehemiah, a man of conviction, the man of passion.